This is Philosophy Bites with me, David Edmonds. And me, Nigel Warburton. Philosophy Bites is available at www.philosophybites.com. Few philosophers have the range of Anthony Kenny. The former master of Balliol College, Oxford, has written three dozen books, including scholarly works on Aristotle, Aquinas, Descartes and Wittgenstein. Who better then to attempt a half a million word new history of Western philosophy, published by Oxford University Press? Kenny is following in the famous footsteps of the English philosopher Bertrand Russell, whose almost racy history of Western philosophy was a surprise bestseller in the mid-20th century. Anthony Kenny, welcome to Philosophy Bites. Thank you. I'm glad to be asked to take part in this. Now, the topic we're talking about today is your history of Western philosophy, a new history of Western philosophy. Approaching this is very much in the same area as what Bertrand Russell did, to write a history from the beginning of philosophy almost to the present day. Did you consciously relate what you were doing to what Bertrand Russell did? Yes, certainly. I'm um, a great admirer of Bertrand Russell's history of Western philosophy. I used to give it to pupils so that they would get some of the excitement of philosophy. I think it's a wonderfully written book. It addresses important philosophical problems and shows that they can be exciting and important. The only problem is that it's wildly inaccurate and extremely unfair, especially to people like Aristotle and Kant. Once the pupils had caught the excitement from Russell, I then used to press into their hands the many volumes of the Jesuit Father Copleston's History of Philosophy, which was nothing like as exciting as Russell's, which was much more accurate. So when I was asked to do this, I set myself the task of writing a set of books that would be more entertaining than Copleston, but more accurate than Russell. I have to say that was not a very high bar to set myself. And you've divided the areas into ancient, medieval early modern philosophy and philosophy in the modern world. Did that fall quite naturally? Are they phases or do they overlap? No, I think it was a natural development. But what is perhaps more unusual about the book is that within each of these four volumes, I've divided it into two parts. First of all, there is a straight chronological review of the philosophers of the period. And then in the second and larger part, I deal with it by topics, maybe metaphysics, maybe logic, maybe ethics, and so on. Now, the reason for this is that there are two different purposes for which people may read histories of philosophy. There may be people who are more interested in the history than the philosophy, people who want to know what it was that people were thinking in a certain period of history. And for them, the chronological thing is what they should look at. On the other hand, I believe firmly that the history of philosophy has a lot to teach us about philosophy itself. And so the idea was that somebody whose main interest, say, was in ethics would turn to the ethics chapters, read what it says there, and then if they got interested in the historical context, turn back to the first part of the book. And would your ideal reader read through the relevant sections from Volume 1 right through to Volume 4, or are you imagining somebody using this as a reference book? I would hope that it is readable right through, and I rather think that OUP are hoping that it's going to be readable right through, and I can give you a very concrete reason why. They told me each volume was to be 125,000 words, and the reason for this was so that the four volumes would add up to half a million words, which I am told is the largest amount of words you can get into a thick paperback to be sold at airports for flights between London and Sydney. Half a million words is a huge number of words to write, but you must have read even more words than that. From your reading and presumably rereading of lots of text, were you surprised by what you found? Well, of course, I'd been, in a sense, reading for the book all my life, and I had put a toe in the water in each of the periods. I've written books on Aristotle for the first period, on Aquinas for the second period, on Descartes for the third period, and on Wittgenstein for the fourth period. So I had some idea what I was getting into. But you're quite right to suggest that my feel for the whole history of philosophy and for who were the worthwhile people did change to some extent while I was writing it. The all-time greats in my mind stayed the same, Plato and Aristotle in the ancient world, Augustine and Aquinas in the medieval world, Descartes and Kant in the early modern world, 
a little hesitant in the final up to the contemporary way. I've no doubt that Wittgenstein is one of them, but whether I should put Marx or Frege as the other greatest philosopher of that period, I hesitate both before and after. More interesting was the philosophers that I had thought nothing much of before I was, as it were, forced to read in them. People who went up, in my opinion, Plotinus went up in my estimation. When I actually read his text, I realized that he argues very skillfully and cogently for these what seem absurd conclusions, that he takes premises which anybody of common sense would accept, or at least any reader of Aristotle would accept, then gradually squeezes you into this extraordinary metaphysical system. Another person who I came to respect much more was Abelard. I had always thought Abelard, you know, had a lot of good things to say. What I hadn't realized till I really got into the philosophical context was how many things he was the first person to say. I thought of him as just one of the scholastics, but actually before the scholastic system, he was just a schoolmaster in Paris, thinking these things up in his own head, which later became to some extent commonplaces of scholasticism. So Plotinus, Abelard, and a third person was Schopenhauer, which took me quite by surprise. For one thing, I came to realize what a wonderful writer he was, but I also thought that his metaphysics though it's impossible to swallow it as a whole, is a wonderful presentation, in a way, of Kantian metaphysics, only written in a much more intelligible way than Kant. It's as if sort of Henry James had been rewritten by P.G. Wodehouse or something. In the final volume, I think Husserl was really the person that I realized I'd completely underestimated. Obviously, looking at the grand sweep of philosophy, you've got an insight into how the subject has changed. Do you think that the ancients, medieval philosophers, early modern philosophers, and recent philosophers were all engaged in the same sort of activity? I think the answer to that is yes and no. Yes, because one can read Plato and Aristotle and see that they were, in many places, puzzling over the same difficult problems as Russell and Wittgenstein were. On the other hand, philosophy was a much broader subject in the past. All kinds of things, say, in the works of Aristotle would now count as parts of zoology, biology, psychology, and so on. I think that philosophical problems often split into ones that become scientific problems with their own methods of investigation, and ones which remain philosophical and conceptual. The reason why those of us who are in philosophy departments these days claim the same title as Plato and Aristotle did, I think, is that we are investigating their problems by the same methods as they did, by reflecting on our concepts, analyzing our language, and so on. Whereas the scientists, though they're equally successors of Aristotle to the philosophers, they, of course, have developed new techniques of observation, of experiment, and so on. I have a view of philosophy which derives very much from Wittgenstein, which is thinking that philosophy is not a science, but it is concerned with understanding rather than with the inquiry into truth. I mean, if you think of philosophy as a science, and a lot of philosophers, particularly in the States, do regard philosophy as a kind of science, then its history must have only an antiquarian interest, you know, because we don't read Newton or Pythagoras to discover anything about mathematics or physics. We read them just as part of history. I don't think that's true of philosophy. I think that we read Plato and Aristotle not just to think of the quaint things people thought long ago, but because they still have things to teach us in certain areas, in areas like metaphysics, ethics, and so on. So I think that philosophy is not exactly a science. It's not exactly an art either. I mean, it's not just like reading Homer or Shakespeare, because philosophy, like science, is interested in the discovery of a certain kind of truth. But I think this position between the sciences in which you are trying to get further in the understanding of truth and the arts in which you're trying to produce something of beauty. This position is, for me, what makes philosophy the most exciting of all subjects. When it comes to the 20th century, there must be many more philosophers alive than there have been in the whole history of philosophy up to this date. That must make it extremely difficult to decide who to focus on. Well, it is, and certainly the last volume I found the hardest, and particularly the 20th century one. I mean, I'm quite convinced that Wittgenstein was the greatest 20th century philosopher and would be willing to defend that at boring length on a different occasion. I never knew Wittgenstein, so my view of him is not coloured by any particular discipleship. I, I later became a trustee of his literary estate, but that was long after his death. 
What I found most difficult was how to deal with the philosophers after Wittgenstein. I think I probably met and often worked with almost all the most important philosophers after Wittgenstein's death. It's very difficult, I think, to choose between people who are as close to you as that and say who are the ones that will be remembered in a hundred years' time and who aren't. And I'm sure that the choice that I have made will offend some people <laughs> and, and will infuriate others. So who are the last philosophers in your book? I divided the historical part in the final volume into continental and analytic. And the last analytic philosopher I discuss is Peter Strawson, who was actually quite a close friend, particularly in his last years. And the continental one was Derrida, whom I knew and admired when he was a young philosopher. We used to meet together occasionally to discuss our joint ideas. But I have to say I thought in his old age he turned rather into a comedian than a philosopher. I found it difficult in my book to treat him with the reverence that I treated other philosophers, so I ended in making some rather rude jokes about him. Just as an aside, I'm rather intrigued by what kind of philosophy you discussed with Derrida. It wouldn't have occurred to me that you two would have collaborated. We found out pretty soon that it wasn't much good him explaining his ideas to me and me explaining my ideas to him. But we found that if we concentrated on a, a figure we both admired, like Descartes, and read a bit of Descartes together, then we could communicate. From your reading of the great philosophers, who would you say are the best prose stylists in philosophy? I think the prize has to go to Plato. Plato's early dialogues, at any rate, are written in very beautiful Greek, but their enormous achievement is that there was then no philosophical vocabulary. There were no technical terms for philosophy. He had to get across any philosophical point he wanted to put across, in the plainest of language. The philosopher that is, I think, for modern people, easiest to read is probably Descartes, because he wrote elegant, short pieces. Well, as Descartes said, he wanted to write so smoothly that even women could read them. I think he was punished for this male chauvinist remark when the one person who quite clearly defeated him in argument was Charles I's niece, Princess Elizabeth, who pointed out the complete incoherence of Descartes' views on the uh, relation between mind and body. And Descartes, I think, knew he was defeated because he was reduced to telling her not to bother her pretty head about the topic because it was dangerous for women to spend too much time on metaphysics. It would damage their health. I'm just stunned by your productivity and the depth of the work that you've done. So, Anthony Kenny, thank you very much. Thank you. And you can hear more Philosophy Bites at www.philosophybites.com. Mm-hmm.